and they're looking at you saying, Judge, we heard you had a cold. We prayed for you. I said, well, I, I thank you. I said, I really do. I said, and then one guy said, Judge, you know, when I read the article on you, it said, Angel in the court. Well, he was holding it up. And I said, uh-huh. I said, you had that in jail? And he said, yeah, they have those papers in jail, Judge. I said, okay. He said, and I showed everybody, this my judge. This I said, well, my judge. Hi, everybody. It's Linda Laurel. Welcome to another episode of Our Voices Matter podcast. I want you to picture this. A defendant in front of a judge gets sentenced to prison by that judge, gets out, goes back to see that judge, and affectionately refers to her as my judge. This is my judge. How does that happen? Well, it happens when a judge looks at a defendant as a human being and allows her humanity to permeate her courtroom. My guest today is that judge. Her name is Lianya Lloyd. She's recently retired judge. She earned her bachelor's degree in education and a law degree from Wayne State University. Before becoming a judge, Lloyd taught at Cass Technical High School and was a partner in the Lloyd and Lloyd Law Firm. The other Lloyd was her twin sister, who was also a judge. Leonia, Leonia rather, was elected to the 36th District Court in Detroit, Michigan in November of 1992. And in 2002, she became a drug treatment court judge. And in 2010, she led the creation and implementation of the second Veterans Treatment Court in Michigan. She is also a new author and this is her book. It is entitled, Your Honor, Your Honor, A Journey Through Grief to Restorative Justice. It is my pleasure to bring you my conversation with Judge Lianya Lloyd. Lianya, it is such a pleasure to have you on our Voices Matter podcast. Um, I'm eternally thankful to our mutual friend, Reggie Turner, for introducing us. So thank you, Reggie. (laughs) And you look lovely. And um, I'm going to just dive right in and share a passage from your wonderful book that I think will be a good way to kind of start our conversation. So I'm going to put my glasses on here. And I love this. This is toward the end of the book. Linda, Linda. thank you for having me. Okay. Of course, (laughs) of course, of course. Okay. And here's what you write. No matter what type of court I presided over, I was determined that any litigant who walked into my courtroom, regardless of his or her problem, walked out an improved person. I wanted defendants to feel that the court cared about them as people and that they were more than case numbers. Listening to the defendant and hearing his or her explanation is sometimes more important to the defendant than the assessed fine. The most important thing to the defendant is being heard. I loved that passage of your book because it says you are all about humanity and people and caring and communication. So explain how that philosophy that I just read in your book has shaped who you are and your life. To me, it is important, Linda, that people be heard. I was a little girl, and and I talked about it in the book, and I was in a particular geometry class, and I kept raising my hand and raising my hand, and the lady would look at me and roll her eyes and as as if I didn't exist and like I didn't matter. And she never, never recognized me for the whole semester, and I never forgot that feeling. So when I became a teacher, I didn't even let people, young, young people who sat in a classroom, you know, real quiet, withdrawn, I'd pull them out. I'd pull them out gently. I had a young lady who just, all you had to do was introduce yourself the first day. And some girls sniggled at her because she was rather thin. And she ran out of my, out of, out of my uh, room. And I said, I ran behind her, told the class, be quiet, ran behind her, grabbed her in the hall. I said, honey, what's wrong? And she said, they were laughing at me. I said, I convinced her to come back and with me. 
I promised her this would never happen again. And when I, she came in, she was crying. She came in and she sat down. And I told them, I said, none of you, I said, have the right to do what you did to this young lady. I said, I want you to check yourself and go look in the mirror when you go home. I said, take a good look and you'll see you can't make jokes about anybody. I said, whatever you do to someone up here, I will do to you. And I guarantee you, it'll be worse than if your classmates did it to you. Never again did that happen. That young lady ended up being a student because she couldn't even get two sentences out. She was so nervous. Her knees were knocking. I saw her maybe seven or eight years after she graduated in a store and she remembered me and she stopped. She said, I don't know if you remember me, Miss Lloyd. I said, I remember you. How could I forget the little girl who ran up, you know? Mm -hmm. And I said, I remember, she said, I graduated college. You'll never, you'll never guess what I, I, I'm doing. I'm a teacher. I said, you teach speech. She said, yes. The bottom line wow. is that everybody deserves to be able to speak. Everybody should be respectful of people speaking. I carry that on into the courtroom. When people get up there and lawyers would say, uh, be quiet. She doesn't need to hear all that. You, just, you, you did your plea. It's, it's time to move on. I said, be quiet. I said, I want to hear what that person has to say. I said, he or she. And they said, well, judge, I just wanted you to know why I did what I did. And I said, go ahead. And they would tell me. And then it gave me a chance to explain the law, to explain to them why what they did, even coming from a good place, was the wrong thing in terms of legality. But I understood you're a father passionate about the police arresting your son right in front of you, and you don't know what he, what he supposedly did. You're asking questions. You're not trying to do anything to the police. And because you ask a question, they locked you up. Now, I said, in their eyes, they don't know if you're coming at them because you love this person. You've already said this is my son. And a lot of parents will charge it. I said, and that brings on altercation. When they tell you to stand back and you don't, they think you're going to charge. I said, do you understand? He said, yes. And tears were coming out. I said, but I understand. And so the way I fashioned that sentence was without a fine. Just six months. Don't pick up any other cases. This case will be dismissed at that time. You know, it, it's letting them so, speak. So, so what you what you did, so you're you're now retired. So you were initially a district court judge and you were handling more misdemeanor cases. Then you became a drug court judge and then you created a veterans court. So during throughout that, as I was reading your book, and there are some really beautifully written and wonderful heartfelt stories about how like you say, people just wanted to be heard. So they had made a mistake. They had done something wrong, sometimes something violent. Right. Um, but no matter, no matter the charge that was facing them, you came at them with a sense of humanity and respect. And that is not something that our judicial system is known for. Um, right. So tell me a little bit about how your approach literally you just gave a couple of examples but how how can our our court system use your approach to bring more humanity in into the way we deal with people as they come before the court well i think workshops number 1 you know they don't really have a lot of workshops for judges you you know particularly beginning judges you 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 go in you get this crash course and it's very 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 general and uh and and when I went in, I was amazed at the one that dealt with sensitivity uh, because they were testing whether or not judges are sensitive to statements that they make in a courtroom, be it the fact that you've got a variety of people in your courtroom. So they showed us the film and they and you're supposed to jot down the different things that you see that were wrong, that the judge said in the courtroom and out of the courtroom in his chambers. And so I, I was like, just writing, I was just writing, writing. And afterwards, when they asked, it was only two black judges sitting in there, okay? Everybody else was white. And they said, how many saw more than 10 infractions that the judge did? I raised my hand immediately. I had a list. And so, and, <laughs> and, and I looked around, I'm the only one with my hand up. And, and they said, and the, and the two moderators looked at each other like, wow. How many saw at least seven? 
Well, how many saw five? And then a few hands went up. I then became, I was like, these people are going to sit in front of people and they can't see some of the things I just saw that clearly spoke racism, clearly spoke, you know, and they can't see it. And if you can't see it, you're going to do it because you don't know any better. And the, the lady next to me, she said, can you believe this? I said, no, I can't. I said, and what, what, what makes me scared is that people will be in front of them, particularly people of color, and they're going to be judged before they open their mouth. I said, if these judges don't get more in tune with sensitivity of what their actions are, because they're not even aware that their actions are mm -hmm. happening. I said, that's dangerous. So, so more, you know, it's, it's, it's so interesting to hear you talk from this perspective, um, especially given what is going on in our country right now and all of the, the racial reckoning that we're having, um, you know, more, more, Black people being killed at, at the hands of police officers, et cetera. We're just about, we're in jury selection now as you and I are recording this interview uh, for the George Floyd murder trial. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I'm curious uh, regarding just everything that you've seen thus far and how this might play out as, as, as the case moves forward. It's going to be difficult for them to, to get a jury, a jury that because mostly everybody has seen something uh, on yeah. this. Uh, so now you've got to delve in even further as to how has it affected them? Can they, can they sit there with an open mind and take the law as the judge says it? Uh, because they, 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 ask that, they have to know that when officers are out on that street, you know, they become for a temporary period of time, a judge and a jury themselves when they decide to make some actions. And again, they're an extension of the court, okay? The extension of that legal system. How do they carry out their job? And I say this as a past former sitting judge who had officers in front of her that I have made apologize to a defendant. Defendant has pled guilty, but you acted outside of the law and disrespectful to the point that you don't call a person out of their name. I don't know if I can say what that officer said, but you put she you can say it. you can say okay. anything you want to say on this podcast. Okay, the, the the lady it was you know they it was disorderly conduct. So a whole bunch of people outside uh, Fourth of July. They were loud. They were rowdy. Uh, they were all at their house drinking, having a barbecue, etc. So the neighbors called and they wanted it quiet. So the police came, a couple of police cars. And then they said, all the women on one side, all the men on the other. And I guess if you didn't move fast enough, like this lady, she's going towards the side for the women. And he said, he called her a black bitch and to get over there. And so when she came to court, she pled guilty for being in this, this little crowd being loud. She mm -hmm. said, that's, that's not the point. I, I'm gonna plead guilty to that. But what I didn't like was the disrespect from this officer. And he called me out of my name. See, these are the things that start fights. And it's the mindset of the officer. And I asked him, did you do that? And he said, uh, well, I probably did. I said, probably is not an answer for me. Did you or did you not? And he said, well, yes. And I said, do you think that was right? Did she do anything that would cause you to do that? No. And I said, then why did you do it? Now you got to remember, you're talking to a black woman. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and so, mm -hmm. and, and he said, well, I, you know, in the streets, we have to show that we, we, we're tough and we're this and we're that. And so it's a persona that they put on and a language that they, that they have to use to match the street lingo. And mm -hmm. I said, but she did nothing. And I, he said, no. And and I want to apologize to her right now. I said, I think that's in order. So he walked over to her and he said, ma'am, would you please accept my apology? And he extended his hand. And then she took his hand and she shook it. And she said, he said, I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry. I was out of line. And so, and then she looked at me and he looked at me and I said, 
good. And then she, she moved back and he said, and I said, look, when you're out there, you to carry yourself a certain way because you represent me. You represent an arm of this court. I said, and that, that I will not have at all. And it, so officers, when they come into a courtroom, what they have to know is that the playing field is even. In other words, I used to say, we're going to have this trial, but I want everybody to know everybody's equal in here. I don't care what uniform you have on. I don't care what job you have. I said, I'm going to listen to all of the evidence. I'm going to listen to what you say, and I'm going to ask questions if I hear things that don't make sense. I said, regardless of who you are. You get let, me ask, let me ask you this. If you were sitting, if you were the sitting judge in this, in this George Floyd murder trial, um, would you ask Chauvin or order him to apologize to Floyd's family since they, he can't apologize to Floyd himself because he's dead? You mean if in fact he got found guilty? If, if in fact he got found guilty, yes. Yeah, I would. I would ask. I would say, um, oh. when you're making statements, do you want to direct any statements to the family of them? Mm -hmm. Because a, 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 one of their family members is gone. Do you have anything, any type of, of apology you want to say to this family that has been hurting and it's in pain? Now, if he's got any kind of heart, he's going to apologize because it was his his knee on that neck, okay? But it depends upon the mindset of that officer, okay? You know, some officers will look at that and say, well, he, he did what he was supposed to do. No, 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 no. The man was not resisting. You know, he was not resisting. He's down on the ground. He can't do anything. Why do you, and the man is begging and pleading. Because I remember the first time I saw that, that clip and my stomach turned. My stomach turned, tears went down my face. And I said, he called for his mother. And, and that night, I, 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 I just, you know, I, it, it just bothered me to the point that it just chilled. And you think that's okay, and it's not. So, and I know how much power officers have out there because that badge gives it to you. But then when you come into a courtroom, sometimes officers, I had one officer, when he heard me talking after I listened to a trial and I, he knew when it, as I, what I was saying, I'm getting ready to rule against him, okay? He had no business treating this young black man the way he did, snatching him out the car and then making him get on the ground and then all of that. And I said, he didn't do anything. All he asked you, he's a passenger in a car. All he asked you is, why do you need my ID? He said, if you say one more word, he said, I'm going to arrest you. He said, for what? That's it. And he said, fat boy, get out. And <laughs> yeah, he was heavy. But he said, man, you don't have to disrespect me and call me out, out of my name. And it went on from there. Yeah. He called five or six police cars yeah, because the guy was so heavy to get him on the ground. So when I got ready to rule and I started preaching, sorry, I got a little bit of that in. <laughs> and I started preaching and he decided he was going to get up. I said, oh, no, 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 no. You're not leaving this courtroom. I said, officers. And my officers blocked the door. I said, sit down. I said, this is my courtroom. And right now you are going to listen to judgment being done on you. When I finish, if you want to walk out then, feel free. I said, but not now. And so he sat down and after I finished, <laughs> and I ruled against him. It was about, uh, how can I put this? I had a smorgasbord of different types of people in my courtroom, Asian, Mexican, et cetera. All of them were there, the tickets he wrote. And he left, meaning all those cases were going to get dismissed. Because if he leaves, they mm -hmm. get just, and I dismissed him with prejudice so he could never bring them back up again. Mm -hmm. And they all said he was the officer and we all wanted a trial because we know what he did to us, just like he did to him. And they were mm -hmm. they were mad they couldn't have a trial, even though I dismissed the case. Yeah. They wanted they, because day. they wanted to be heard. They, they wanted, wanted to, to tell heard. their story. You know, so much of this, this whole mindset of the officers, they're talking about, we're talking about policing now, 
but just the the mindset. Let's just talk about the mindset of of so many white people who feel privileged, especially if they are in a position of power, like a police officer, um, who feel that it's okay to call a black woman a bitch or to call somebody out of their name because they are seen as lesser than, as less than human. Right. And I believe, maybe naively, but that one of the ways to start to get to the root of that is to, first of all, have, have open and honest conversations like this, where we're talking about this openly, but even more important than that is to find um, a, a, a mechanism or a way for, for people to engage with people who don't look like them, who don't have the same faith, who don't, you know, who are just different. And, and then when we start to engage on a human level, then we find out that, you know, guess what? There's a whole lot that, that really binds us together much more so than there is than that which divides us. And yes. as 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 an, as an officer of the court, you know, you spent your entire career seeing this dynamic play out. Right. Um what are your thoughts about where we are as a country right now as it relates to race and social justice because you have been in the thick of it for all of your career? You know, I, I looked when George, uh, George Floyd died and how people responded, and I saw the whole country react. I saw the marches in France and all everywhere for him. And I began to say, because I remember the Black Power Movement, because I was very much a part of that when I was young. So I, I looked at that and I said, maybe there's some hope. Maybe there's some hope. There are young people who are listening are young people who understand. Just, just like I've had officers that work with me with Project Fresh Start, and they had to go corral up girls of the evening and bring them in. Now, I had one officer tell me, he worked with me for two years. He said he was white. He said, you know, they made me do this, this program. I didn't want to do this program. He said, because I didn't believe those women could ever change. And the majority that they saw were black, but there's a whole bunch of white ones out there too. And he said, but I watched you in this courtroom. I watched these girls. I watched them actually change. He said, I didn't think it was possible. He said, and they stayed that way for two years. He said, and when they told me they were transferring me to a different department, I asked for them not to. He said, you have made me see things totally different. He said, and I see that things can be different. See, there are officers that would come up to me, some would apologize, listening to something being said in that courtroom. Or I'd even have officers, white officers, I'm talking to a defendant, uh, and, and that defendant is black, it's a different trial, you know, and, and he gets out in the hallway, he threatens the plaintiff who sued him, and, and he's mad, and so he's threatening to kill her. So she runs back in the courtroom. She says, Judge, he just threatened to kill me out there because, you know, you ruled against him. And I said, I looked and I said to my, my court officer, go get him. And so and he said, OK. And then I had two officers, police officers sitting there for another case. They said, do you want us to assist Judge? I said, absolutely. He did. They ran out there and grabbed him. He tried to fight. And they lifted him up and carried him in the courtroom <laughs> and he put him down. And I said, where did you think you were going? You can't threaten this lady. I said, she was a middle-aged lady. She was scared of him and she was scared for her life. I said, if anything happens to her, I said, I'm making a record on this. I said, I will make sure you are the first one. If she calls me and she tells my clerk that you're bothering her, I will have you brought back in. I said, do you understand that? So. And I gave her a card. She was to call directly to the court. And I knew if she calls, I know he's bothered her. Yes. He never made the call. But but the bottom oh line is, gosh. you know, you see a lot of things that police, you got the good ones, and then you got some ain't so good. 
And and the ones that are very good, I like I, I would talk to officers. I said, how do you talk to our young black males? I said that are under 25 and are prone to be stopped when they go out the door. I asked this back then. He said, Judge, what I tell young people, and I speak to him all the time, he, he said, if the officer stops you, first thing you do is be kind, be considerate. He said, you know why? Because we're not ready for that. He said, we ready for you to call us all kind of names. We ready for you to holler and scream at us. Why are you stopping me? Blah, blah, blah. He said, but we're not used to if we stop you and then and, and you say, good afternoon, officer. How are you today? He said, that, that right there. He said, and then if they continue like that, chances are if they had a tail light out, I'm going to give them a warning. He said, but if you come at me the wrong way, I already have ammunition to give you the ticket. I've got the ammunition. I see the light out. I see this that you did wrong. He said, but if you come at me politely, and I would tell that to a lot of, of people that would come in my courtroom. I said, for those of you who are, are young black males, I said, when officers approach you, I said, I don't care how hard it is, be extremely polite. Let them uh, start the conversation polite. I said, chances are whatever's going to happen is going to be a whole lot better than if you don't. I said, that is what you're going to have to do probably till you get to be about 40. I said, about 40 years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> so much of, of course, who you are and the way that, that you conducted yourself on the bench and in the classroom and um, and even as a as a model in your younger years with your beloved twin sister, Leona, who is in that gorgeous photo behind you. Um, and I know that, you know, it's such a beautiful story. And I, I really do urge people to, to, to get the book. It's called Your Honor, Your Honor, A Journey Through Grief to Restorative Justice. Um, the grief is because you lost your beloved sister in June of 2001, and, and it was tough. It was really difficult. How did you get through that period in your life? That was, you're right, that was the toughest period I've ever, ever, ever been through. And I didn't really think I was going to make it through. I really didn't. I, I would wake up and I just didn't know where I was anymore. We were so, so close and everything and she, we did. She passed, she passed suddenly. She just passed It was out. suddenly, right. Yeah. We, had, we had just spoke to a bunch of uh, junior high kids at their graduation. We've been their commencement speakers and they filmed her. So one of the pictures in the book at the end was her I speaking. I and and, that. and I beautiful. took it, I, I, I took it from the, the, the still uh, of the, of the film that of they the gave. Mm -hmm. And it was just, it was just a fluke that they, they recorded her the same day that she died later that night, a few hours after we got back. And we were laughing and giggling. She lived three houses down from me. So, you know, I, I can't even describe when someone who doesn't, to my knowledge, have anything wrong with them. And she's laughing. She just got through walking five miles on the treadmill when she came back because she had a little outfit on. And and she's just giggling and laughing. And I said, be quiet, be quiet. You and my cousin, I said, they, they, they kept talking. And I said, I'm going to start this video. This is movie night. I'm starting this one more time. And then we were sitting on that same couch. And then when her foot hit me, she was gone, just like that. I mean, think about that. The person is laughing with you. And the next second, they have disappeared. No, no sounds. It wasn't like the melodramatic stuff you see on TV. Nothing. She just kicked me. And I said, why'd you kick me? And I looked at her and her eyes were half masked. She was gone. And I, I, that is what that first night, I just, I didn't believe it really happened. I was at, I was in the ambulance. I watched that compression machine hitting her, hitting her, hitting her. And when the doctor came out and he looked at me and he said, we did all we could do, but her heart never started back up. And I said, what are you saying? And, it, you know, it was like, I, this, this is not. How do, you how do you comprehend something right. like that? It, yeah. You know, 
we were known as twins for justice throughout all of Detroit and a lot of parts of the other parts of the of, of Michigan. And when even when we'd walk into a church, sometimes we'd like to come in certain times to hear the minister preach. We didn't want to hear all the other stuff in the beginning. And we want to hear him <laughs> preach. And so we knew what time to come, you know, and we would walk in and we would go quietly, you know. And, and as we're walking, the, the minister looked up and said, well, the twins for justice are here. And I said, you know, like, no, 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 no. Uh, but <laughs> right. And then we would cool, we would wave and then we would sit down and, and then listen to the rest of, 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 you know, church. But the bottom line was that we were known to, because we did so many things together. And even in the court, we did things together. That's why I convinced her to run. So, so your, somehow, court, your court rooms were next to each other at one point, weren't they? Exactly. They I mean, were that's next just to each extraordinary. Other. Wow. You know, and, and it was like, you, when she first got on the bench, lawyers said, we are, we were wondering what your sister's going to be like. We know what you're like. And they said, so, so they went in there and they came back to my courtroom and they said, she sounds like you. She <laughs> makes jokes like you. They said, she laughs like you. I said, well, I haven't seen her on the bench. She's seen me on the bench, but I haven't, I helped train her, but she has, I haven't seen her. And when, when, she, and I would be out or, or she would be out. They'd come to my courtroom from her courtroom and said, judge, your sister's out today. Uh, rather than us get another court date and come back, can we have the case brought in front of you? And I said, they said, because my, my, you know, my defense, defense is here and he can't come back until such and such. And so I said, OK, fine. See my clerk. Come on in. And so they, he said, you can think of like whatever you're going to decide. Both of you would do the same thing. So it doesn't matter. And <laughs> it doesn't I, and matter I would, which one. <laughs> it, 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 it didn't matter. But it was so oh difficult goodness. that, um, you know, I just prayed. I said, I don't I don't know what to do. The next day, my, my the lady who used to be my my uh, marriage counselor, she came in and, and I looked at her like. But she does marriage counseling. And she said. I know what you're thinking. She said, I helped you with your marriage counseling. She said, but I'm also a certified grief counselor. And I said, oh, boy, she, did you need that? You need right, that. Right I, in she, there. That's what she said. She said, I saw your sister's picture on the 11 o'clock news. And I knew right then you needed me. And I didn't, she doesn't, she didn't make house calls. She doesn't do stuff like that. You had to come to her office. She didn't go around. And she came for a whole week like that, every single and, day. And in your book, you talk about how important it was that she reached out to you right in that moment before you had a chance to fall into that deep depression, out of which you might not ever have come. Right. So when there is that kind of mental stress and anguish, the faster you can get help, the better, which is such, I think, an important conversation to have at any moment. But at this moment, we've just come off of the week where mental health has been in the forefront because of the Megan and Harry interview. And just to think that Megan asked for help and right. was denied it is mind blowing when you juxtapose that with your experience of right. someone saying, you need help right now and as a right. result you were able to pick up the pieces and move on with your life and then the, you, you hit it on the you hit that right on the head i mean it's crucial yeah it, it, it is it is so crucial i had people coming into my drug court that didn't get the help they had loss they went through depression okay because it starts out with grief and it went into depression they use drugs to get out of depression and you don't get out of it it just coats it over it helps you function but then your whole life kind of goes out of whack because you're on drugs, but you're still dealing with this loss, you know, a loss of a son being shot down in front of you, a, a, a loss of, you know, uh, uh, someone leaving you. You've been married to them all these years and they just decide to leave and say, I, I'm in love with someone else and I'm taking the house. You know, our kids are grown and gone and goodbye. And then the person says, I can't, mm -hmm. I can't, mm -hmm. I don't want to live in this world anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you get that kind of deep, deep grief and it's turning into depression, and I knew that, I know that it can turn into that. And and there I was going through no one, everybody around me, but no one can help me. 
And then she walks in and she just starts talking to me and talking to me. And, and I said, and as I, and I remember this, just like it was yesterday, I was talking to her and tears just flowing. And I said, I'll never stop crying. She said, yes, you will. I said, no, I won't. And she said, yes, you will. She said, in fact, one day you're going to be able to talk about her and you're going to be able to smile. I said, oh, no, I won't. No, I won't. No, I won't. I can't talk about her without crying. And she said, but you will. What you and she started telling me what stage of grief I was in. And then at every day she came in, I would tell her, I would I unload on her what I was feeling. And she would tell me what that was. And then I said, okay, after seven days of coming to see me, I'm gonna come and see you. She she had me order medication. I couldn't sleep. She knew that the first day. She said, Have you slept? I said, No, I can't. Mm-hmm. I keep being my sister. I keep yeah. giving her compressions. I can't, I can't sleep. She said, no, 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 you got to sleep. Have you ate? You got to sleep. You got to eat. You kept talking. It took about three months or so um, of this constant um, just reaching out and intervention and, and, you know, medical, psychological, mental health help that you so desperately needed. And as you said just a moment ago, that you know what that's like. Um, not only now from your your personal experience, but as you were growing up, as you and your sister were growing up, your mother had multiple nervous breakdowns. And so right. you learned a lot as you watched her go through her struggles with mental health and right. how she was able ultimately to come out of it and, and live a, a, a beautiful life before she, she ultimately passed. Right. Well, you know, before her nervous breakdowns, what led to it was the subregnoid hemorrhage and the fact that it erased her memory. Yeah. The fact that the career she had as a registered nurse was no more. Now mm-hmm. today, what she had was called a bleeding stroke. And the stroke, if you know about stroke, it, it takes away a lot of memory. Of people, And a lot of people, usually 80 to 90% can't go back and do the jobs they did. Well, my mother was no different, but she didn't get the counseling that they have now. He didn't get that counseling to say, reinvent yourself. Do you think if she had gotten the counseling then that it might have made a difference for her, that it she would not have had the subsequent breakdowns? Yes, I think it would have made a difference for her and my father. My father didn't mm-hmm. understand it either. He thought after 15 years, the doctor gave her five years to live and he did not tell her that. And so he kept hearing her say, uh, you know, I'm, I'm here, and uh, but I was supposed to be gone, and blah, blah, blah. And my, and my mother would do this often, right? And so one day, it was about, I'd say maybe 10 years after this, uh, she was saying this same thing. And, and then my father said, look, they gave you five years to live. You have lived 10. And he said, you're, go- you're fine. You're going to be fine. She said, what did you say? And he said, they gave you <laughs> five years to live at most, but you passed that. So you're okay. And my mother thought, and she said, oh my goodness, I'm living on borrowed time. Do Peter. That's what she used to say. Do Peter. I'm living on borrowed time. <laughs> oh, I'm not even supposed to be. And then that started a new way. My father said, oh my goodness. My father wouldn't got a drink. He had started a new wave of, of depression with my mother. But it was her inability to do a job she loved so much. My mother, yeah. valedictorian of her nursing class, loved nursing, and she couldn't go back. She kept her reciprocity of her state license up mm-hmm. until she died. Until the loss, she, the loss of that career, and something that you poured your heart and soul into and worked so hard for. And again, it's it's the loss and the grief that you have to go through in right. order to process that loss in a healthy way, and, which, and is a healthy the, way yeah. which is why the intervention piece is, is so very important. Even the doctor said, when she had the first nervous breakdown, he said, that's depression. Mm-hmm. And I said, we were high school kids. So we were like, depressed about what? We don't see her depressed. She's laughing and joking. You can be depressed. And, and I carried all of this knowledge into doing drug court, helping the depressed folks I saw and knowing that they need immediate, immediate attention. 
She was depressed about not fulfilling her life anymore. How do you, how do you, you raising two little girls that you don't even remember? When we're so little, we don't know my mother don't remember us. Mm -hmm. And then you, 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 in your mind, you're going to raise these two little girls. There are bits and pieces of your life that comes back, but mm -hmm. not enough for you to go back in there and work. And you see all your friends that are your nursing friends and they're working. They want you to come back. They knew how yeah. much she had lost because they were nurses. And uh, but they wanted to help. She wouldn't, every, she wouldn't everything do that you and Leona went through as you were growing up, it seems to me, prepared you to be able to take that lived experience and translate that into the way that you conducted your courtrooms, the way you ran your courtrooms. You both were determined to see the people and not the problem. Right. 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 If I'm, yeah. Yeah. Right. And, and I just, you know, that it gives me chills to think about that and to, um, to want so badly for us to be able to, as a society, take that philosophy as we engage with each other to see each other as who we are not the the political bent that we're bringing to bear not what our baggage is not you know it's it's how are you doing what what right. is going what is going on right. let me listen for a minute right and that's why when you said you would talk to the defendants in your courtroom and and say and give them the opportunity, even if they've been sentenced, to hear what it is was going on with them that led them down this road. Right. Because that and that goes back to the line that I read at the beginning is that you want them to come out of that courtroom feeling as though their lives have been improved. Right. Improved. What a word. Right. For someone coming out of court. Yeah. It it to, you know to me. I, my sister called when she used to come watch my courtroom before she became a judge. She said, it's like an empowerment zone. They're coming in here one way with you. She said, and then they're, they're leaving out a whole different way. One lawyer said in drug court, I, I had certain lawyers that always did drug court. But then every now and then I would get one in that there wasn't a real drug court you know, lawyer, but they knew how to, to deal with drug court. But they weren't used to the process. And so one one lawyer said, Judge, I've never seen you lock up some defendants and for what they did as a sanction. And they actually smile at you and wave at you as they are taken out of here and say, see you in a few days, Judge. I said, see you then. And then, and then they said, the ones that are coming back from the sanction, they're so happy to see you. And and they say and then she said and they're looking at you saying judge we heard you had a cold we prayed for you I said well I, I thank you I said I really do I said and then one guy said judge you know I read the article on you it said angel in the court when he was holding it up and I said uh huh I said you had that in jail and he said yeah they have newspapers in jail judge I said okay he said and I showed everybody this my judge this I said is my judge. Right. I said, but I put you in there. He said, but I know why you did. I know what I did. He said, you put me here because you love us. You put us to get quiet and to look at what we've done. So when we come back out and continue the program, we're in a better place. We understand what we did was wrong. And that was your way of telling us, get this together. Mm. You were trying to prevent us from having a permanent record. You love us and we love you. And yeah, I told everybody, this is my judge. And this, is my, this is my judge. Oh, I just <laughs> love that. I love that. Okay, so you have now retired. Yeah. Um, what What is next for you? How are you going to use all of your, your expertise and everything that you have learned and given to the world thus far to move into this next phase of your life? Well, one of the things I'm doing is that um, I, I did a veteran stand down when I was a judge and uh, where I actually took the court to the homeless vets at their stand down. Um, mm -hmm. Vets who had tons of cases didn't go because they had addictions, et cetera. Now they're on the road to recovery, but they're scared. They don't want to come to court building. They're going to get locked up. And I was dismissing cases left and right. But what I what, when I left the court, 
they wanted me to get on their board. And I agreed to be on their board because I found those things that I did with that group for four years was it, it I mean, it was one, I, I was already happy with doing drug court. I was already thrilled with doing Project Fresh Start. And I was thrilled with the veterans court that I had. But this was different. This was These were homeless people that were trying to make a way to come back into society. And, uh, and I said, I know one man said, I was at a dinner, I got through speaking. And he said, uh, they said, wait, judge, there's someone who wants to speak to you. So I'm at this big dinner and I'm looking out. And this guy comes up with these with these flowers. And he said, I appeared in front of you two years ago. He said at the stand down. Well, that meant one day. And he said, you took away all my legal baggage. He said, I was able to get a car. He said, I was able then to get a job. He said, then I was able to move my family into a house. He said, all of that because you took away my garbage. Can I please give you these flowers? And I said, thank you. You didn't have to do that. And he said, oh, but I did. And so he came and he gave me flowers. And there were over 300 homeless vets sitting out there that belonged to this agency at this big dinner that they had, this dressed up dinner. And and I, I knew how meaningful that work was. Okay. So when I joined the board, I said, I'm going to add another court. I'm going over here to circuit court now. I'm going to pitch to them. I want them to join this team. I already got 36 district court on. They're going to continue this. That's that's a done deal. That's not going to stop. I said, but then I got them to come and they begin to bring programs. They've been doing it for four years with me. They've been doing programs to help them regarding felonies, regarding domestic violence cases, et cetera. The point is, is to help as many people as I can. I also have a scholarship fund. I started that, that when I came back to work, I had already went, met with the dean, had had my lawyer there. We were drafting a scholarship fund to give back to the, the minority students at the law school. And uh, I set up two of them, one in undergrad and one in, in, in law and, school. And this is, is this Wayne State? What, yes, what, what, at, at Wayne, Wayne State. State. At Wayne State, and, okay. And so I wanted it an endowed fund. So even when I'm gone, it's going to keep giving scholarships out. And so I keep working with them. Now that they know I'm retired, then they really reach me. And I go to things. I go to the lunches. I talk to the the, the young law so you're, students. You're as busy. You're as busy as ever. But what you're continuing to do is to pay it forward. To pay it That's forward it. and to make sure that even even I, I'm on. I'm a founding member of this board that we have. Uh, the Black Alumni Law Group, because we want to make sure law schools are equitable. We want to make sure that they have enough Black teachers in the law school. You know, you you have to feel comfortable looking at people looking at you that you can respond to. Exactly. It's what that's, you know, so much of, so much conversation has come up about that in these, in this last year. Thankfully, just people finally understanding that representation is important. Um, it's in, crucial. In, across the board, across it, the board. It's crucial. Okay, my, my last question for you as we wrap up is what do you want people to take away from your book and to take away from your legacy on the bench and off? What I want people to take away from the book is intertwined uh, kind of with the legacy. And that is that I never want them to stop dreaming and planning. OK, have a plan for your life and make it make it big and then have some smaller plans right before and each one mounting up to that lark. And I want you to focus. I want you to do the things that are necessary to get those steps done. You know, if in fact it becomes hard, just remember something. If it, it's going to be hard because it's worth something. If it wasn't worth anything, it's going to be very relatively easy and everybody can have whatever it is that you're trying to get. But if it's hard and life is going to interfere with your plan, understand that life is going to teach you some very difficult, hard lessons. But you're to learn from it. learn from those lessons because those lessons are there to really help you grow and to make you flourish. If you can withstand every bump in the road that you're going, you're going to be all right. And just know that you're going to be all right. And don't ever say, I don't think I can do this. 
Yes, you can. You have to pull the strength within you. I had to find out that loss, my loss of my sister wasn't going to define me. It wasn't going to define me. And when I, I prayed that God gave me strength and he showed me that I had it in me and it came rising up to the top. That's what they have to do is that 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 strength that you have that you haven't even tapped on. It, as I used to say to defendants, you pick the path to go down. That wasn't the one you were supposed to be on. You're supposed to be on a path of greatness. I said, once you get on that path of greatness, don't let anybody take you off. I don't care if people come to you and think you're crazy. I don't care if they talk you down and say, oh, it makes no sense. I've don't had let do nobody turn you around. Right? Don't let nobody <laughs> turn you around. Don't let nobody turn you around. <laughs> you know, let, because they will try. And they will try. When they told me I, I was going to run for judge and, and they said, People don't win against running against an incumbent. You're running against 10. They said, are you crazy? They said, Liana, you don't have a chance. I said, I'm going to be a different kind of judge. And I just felt I wouldn't have put that in my head if, in yeah. fact, it, it wasn't supposed to be and, there. And you you have done that and and so much more. There there are We probably will never know how many lives you and your sister have touched. and um, literally changed and you are still on that path for her and for you and it has been such a pleasure and an honor to speak with your honor and um it, I, I just I feel so blessed that that you took this time to share with our audience thank you thank you thank you thank you and um you. i look forward to having you back sometime soon thank you for having me linda and i'll be back anytime you want me all right you got it Okay. I so enjoyed my conversation with Judge Lloyd. I hope you did as well. I want to leave you with one final thing that she writes in her book. Communication, consistency, fairness, compassion, individuality, thinking outside the box, and the ability to step out on faith are the components of the formula judges can use while still operating within the canons of judicial ethics and upholding the integrity and independence of the judiciary. They can turn their courtrooms into empowerment zones, making the world a better place. Amen to that. And I think we can all use that formula to make the world a better place. Connection, compassion, empathy. Thank you so much for giving Judge Lloyd permission to speak and for having the courage to listen with an open mind. If you're enjoying our conversations here on Our Voices Matter podcast, please spread the word, like, share, subscribe, and bring more people to our audience so that we can together make this world a better place. We'll see you next time.